So you guys may have noticed that I've been streaming a lot more uh, recently. And one of the things that I was struggling with at the beginning was, what the hell is the point in subscribing to me, basically? Um, so one of the things that I want to do uh, pretty much every week uh, moving forwards is have a subscriber Q&A video, which um, you can go on my Discord if you're a subscriber. There's a channel that only you guys can see and interact with. Uh, and you can ask me questions and I'll collect the, the best questions or people can, you know, upvote the ones that they want to see answered. And then I'll go through them in, you know, a 30 minute to an hour long video, uh, just answering as many as I can get through in that time. Um, I'm expecting the the questions to be very general at the beginning, you know, and jokey as well. But as the weeks go on i think they'll end up just being more uh more topical and like more based around what's happening in overwatch or what's happening you know on any project that i'm working on at that point in time um and it's a way as well of being able to answer a question once and then put it in a video and then if I keep getting asked the same question over and over on stream you know for example if someone says uh what do you think about um Paris versus Atlanta when Atlanta 4 0 them, I can direct them to this and I'll have like a, you know, a five to 10 minute answer for them rather than going through it a hundred times over and over again on my stream, which is what tends to happen. So I'm not really optimistic that that's going to work because most people that just spam, you know, questions over and over again, uh, what do you think of the new hero, etc. Uh, I'm not going to go and follow a link to somewhere else, but at least then I don't have to keep repeating myself. Okay, so, uh, first question was, in fact, not even the first question, but the way that I'm going through these is the most, uh, th the most thumbs up um, questions from my subs in the channel, and so we start with a classic, which is basically just a Twitch, pa uh, Twitch chat copy pasta. I don't know why I'm even giving it the time of day, but there you go, that's the kind of person I am. Drew Double W asks, Hey Sideshow, big fan, first time, long time. Just wanted to know if you could say exactly when you'll be back in LA. I'm worried the Nans is going to take Bren out back and all yell at him because of mean Reddit comments. He needs someone to stand next to him and make him look smart. So if you could just get to LA and start dribbling ASAP, that would be great, thanks. I'll take the answer on the air. Oh, and what's your favourite ketchup? Okay, I don't know exactly when I'm going to be back in LA. I don't think Bren's going to get shot in the back of the head because of mean Reddit comments, but who knows? Uh... If you want to do some kind of cruel social experiment, you could try just highlighting somebody and going super hard on them and see if it ends up with them with them being taken out back. Uh, I don't think so, though. Uh, Nate Nanser isn't some kind of mafia boss. Or is he? Um, and what is my favorite catcher? Oh, and so in terms of the visa stuff, there has been progress on that recently. Uh, there's an article coming out um, about the same time as this video is coming out as well, where I said there's been uh, there's been some good progress within the last week, and I hope to get there fairly shortly. I don't really have many other details that I can share publicly at the moment, um, but it, things are definitely moving, whereas they hadn't been moving for a long time before that. So uh, should be fairly shortly. Um, what's your favorite ketchup, uh, Heinz or Bust? But honestly, I'm not a fan of ketchup either. I think anybody who eats ketchup is probably lacking something in their in their palate. I, ketchup is an incredibly tangy, not even very tomatoey tasting thing. And the fact you put such a tang on all of the generic foods like chips or whatever just to get you through them, I think says more about the people eating it. Uh, having said that, I do... Uh, <laughs> I do actually quite like ranch, which apparently is a terrible thing to admit in America. I, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, but that might just be because I've never had it before, you know. But I do like mayonnaise and stuff like that. Okay, obviously spent far too long on that literally useless question. Uh, Captain James T. Kink asks, Can you tell us in exact detail the beef you have with American bread versus European bread? So we can have it once and for all in video format. Now, I'm not going to go into it here. This is, I, I mean, immediately, I've got a joke question and one that I'm not even going to go into. But the reason that I'm not going to go into it is that I, when I've been in the UK, it's bothered me so much because bread is one of my favorite foods. That might sound really stupid because bread is fairly, you know, considered fairly plain and generic. It's just... It's what the plebs have, you know, bread and water or whatever. But um, you really can get... It, it just adds so much to every to every meal to have a delicious crusty loaf or a little slice of this and that. It's so good. Um, and it's bothered me being in the UK that I can't get this stuff when I go back to LA. 
So what I'm what I've done is I found about let me just have a look. I found about ten. I'm just looking at my uh, my Chrome bookmarks at the moment. I found about ten different bakeries all scattered within uh, probably within ten miles of where I live in LA. And I'm going to go and visit each one of them and rate the bread that I find there and create a little YouTube series out of it because I'm that serious about how fucked up the bread situation is in LA. And I might start just by getting some... Because the, the thing is, you can get decent bread from the fucking supermarkets in the UK. Uh, if you go into a supermarket and you get even, even a fucking... Even just a loaf off the shelf that's in a plastic packet, it's not going to blow you away, but it's edible. It's even sometimes reasonably nice. But the ones in the US are so shit. They're awful. It, it's, I can barely eat them. They're really terrible. And so just the... Even the even the crappy bread is so crap. And then the best bread that I've had from like Porto's Bakery, which is where a load of people told me to go. It's like the most famous bakery in LA. Was was dog shit as well. It wasn't as good as the stuff you get in the supermarkets in the UK. So anyway, um, I, I'm gonna go through a bunch of different bakeries and do like a I don't know the pengest munch, but <laughs> but for bread, I'm not sure it'll take off. But the point isn't for it to go viral. The point is just to shame American bread. Or, or actually, the point is to, for me to try and find some good ones. I think uh, Monte Cristo really wanted to find some good bread as well, and uh, and hadn't. So uh, maybe it'll be of benefit to other people that uh, live in LA or forced to live in LA. Okay, Precocious asks, how do you feel about the fact that Shanghai has more wins than both of the LA teams combined? That is a kind of nuts situation, but I and I, I feel like there's a, quite a bit to get into there. The Shanghai Dragons, when people came... Okay, so let's start off with what a lot of people still think about Shanghai, which I saw plastered all over the fan stuff, is that they expected Shanghai this season, in 2019, to be as bad as they were in 2018. And there was still, like, a lot of memes about them and stuff like that. I mean, some of the some of the people who did know were making, like, you know, ironic memes when they went Norton 2. It was like, oh, here we go again. But nobody who really knew the players that they've added in 2019 I, I thought there was any chance of this team going winless. I mean, most people had them about middle in their power rankings. Some people even had them way higher than middle. Um, I think I had them maybe somewhere like like 12th, I want to say, something like that, maybe 13th. I'm not 100% sure. So just under average. Um, so first of all, I think it's uh, the large off-season and the fact that there wasn't really a way of keeping people, like, bang up to date with what's going on. You know, there's things like Owl60 and there's various pieces of news written. But for a casual fan that only really tunes into Twitch when Owl's going on, uh, they didn't realize that Shanghai is not just an improved team over 2018. They're just a totally different team. They're just a brand new team playing under the same name. And the only player that's the same is Gregory, and she hasn't even been playing the most recent matches because they've been playing Sombra Goats instead. So... Yeah, so for starters, the, the entire um, assumption that they were going to be poor is, and therefore the idea that Shanghai is some kind of measuring stick is a little bit off. Um, in terms of where Shanghai was going to finish, it's pretty interesting because in the Apex, fi uh, sorry, not Apex, Contenders Finals, when they played against Runaway, and Runaway finally ended up winning their first uh, their first championship, Um Kongdu Panthera, who this Shanghai roster is based on, looked like they should have won that series. I mean, they were incredibly close to being able to win, and Runaway came all the way back and beat them. So, the fact that this team is now, you know, a middling team, rather than an incredible team like the Vancouver Titans, is quite an interesting one, actually. You know, you're, instead of asking the question, why is Shanghai not terrible, I think a more valid question to ask is, why is Shanghai not at the same level as the Vancouver Titans? And I think there's a couple of reasons uh, for that. I think, for starters, losing um, losing Raw and losing Decay is a pretty big deal when it comes to um, the teamwork and synergy that they had built up, especially when it's a GOATS meta, and a lot of that is going to revolve around your Ryan and Zarya. Um, secondly, they didn't actually play that much GOATS, uh, because Ding... In in Korea, they hadn't really gone down the avenue of Sombra Goats, where you can substitute out your Diva for a Sombra, which would have been perfect for Kongdu Panthera, by the way. If they had known how to play that comp, I think they would have 
had an even stronger chance at winning that. And we might be talking about them as one of the best teams. Anyway. Um, they didn't really like to play goats that much because Ding isn't very comfortable on Diva and had to play Diva in that meta. So uh, if he'd been able to play Sombra, it would have been nutty. Um, and now that they're playing as Shanghai Dragons, they don't really have that synergy from playing a ton of goats like Vancouver Titans did. And they had to integrate new players. So they, they don't really have either of the great advantages that you would want from a really good goats team. Um, and players like Ding, of course, have switched over roles and... Uh, again, they they don't really feel comfortable playing that much goats. They tended towards sombra goats, etc. And they've you know they had a lot of main tank issues where fearless was, I mean either underperforming and left to go to Korea or is ill and will return at some point, <coughs> whichever one of those you want to believe. Um, and then they you know they were playing with Young Jin for a long time and then they pick up Gamsu and try and integrate him in. So they've had a lot of main tank issues as well, but. And, and so I think their record at the moment isn't too bad, all things considered. They're actually looking like a fairly decent team. They didn't look very comfortable playing default goats, uh, but they've certainly found their niche playing Sombra goats in the last week or so. Um, and they've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with a lot of pretty decent teams. And when the meta changes, if you're able to unleash DM and Ding as a DPS duo on some of their most comfortable heroes, these guys are going to pound. If this went to double sniper and DM was on Widow and Ding is on Hanzo, these might be the two best uh, players or like the best DPS duo for that meta in the whole league. I think maybe only Carpe and EQO would be able to rival them. So, I mean, crazy shit from these guys if you get them in the right meta. Ding's also perhaps the world's best Farah, just so fluid on that hero. Um... And a very good Sombra as well. So the fact, but also the fact that they lost to Spark and you know played them relatively close, and then the Titans, and then a Fuel two three. I don't think Shanghai are doing that badly, and I think you know we've got to give them credit. These guys are definitely looking like a, a mid table team. Um, now for the both of the LA teams, it really has been disastrous for them, hasn't it? And the fact, as you say, that it, both LA teams combined only have one win is really unfortunate uh one of the things to note is that the pacific division is mega stacked this season at least at the beginning the pacific is outrageous um and even as we go throughout the season i think it'll continue to be outrageous the atlantic division has a lot of teams towards the lower end and the majority of the worst teams are down there but the, the pacific has a lot of titanic teams that's going to make these middle of the pack kind of teams like Valiant and Gladiators seem a lot worse because they have a tougher strength of schedule. So the strength of schedule has not been kind for either of these guys. Um, I'll tackle the LA Valiant first though. The Valiant um, looked like they were playing people very close at the beginning of the season. They played Spark in a decent game. Now that we've seen the level of everybody, I would not say that the Spark Valiant game was particularly high skill. Now that we've seen where everybody else was. But because it was only week one and it was only two days into the tournament, or maybe the, th yeah, the third day of the tournament, um, it actually was probably the highest skill match from both sides that we'd seen so far. It wasn't just a blowout where one team was good and the other team was shit. It wasn't two shit teams. It was two fairly decent teams that both knew how to play GOATs relatively well. Um, and then they played against NYXL and went to five maps there too. This is a team that knows... This is a team that's individually skilled. Fate's very good on Ryan. I don't believe the some people that say Fate is uh, is pretty terrible. I know that Wolf is not a not a big Fate fan at all. I think the guy's good. I think he's very good at Ryan. I think he can be a good Winston stuff like that. Now the question is whether or not I think he's in charge of calling along with Cookie when they play both of those together, and. It seems like something's getting massively fucked up in teams in terms of their uh, coordination. Their teamwork is not that great. They're not that slow to, to move on a lot of stuff. And they don't really put a lot of resources into Fate, to, um, weirdly, because normally when you have a very vocal main tank, a lot of the stuff does revolve around them. Um, but the synergy with Kariv has uh, not been particularly great, even though Kariv is just vomiting out damage. 
something very weird is going wrong there. Now, I can't speak exactly to what's going wrong with the Valiant, but I do think their support line is really... Uh, is really dropping the ball a lot of the time, and they seem to be getting worse. Um, Kuki isn't a playmaker and doesn't look particularly comfortable on uh, Lucio, and so seems to compensate for that by playing very passively. Um, and isn't it seemed like <coughs> it seemed like he was better with speed boost, disengages, and reengages earlier on in the season but the recent games against the charge and the titans uh, fair enough against the titans but whatever charge and defiant as well actually particularly the charge game though the speed boosts speed boosts were all over the place they were shocking they were horrible there was no disengages they were just getting rallied into and killed that's disastrous if you lose and the enemy team only pops a rally what the fuck were you even doing so uh really shocking play there and also the ult timings from their supports have been really tragic Izayaki, for all the praise he gets for be being able to frag out, and he definitely can frag out, his trance timings have been fairly horrible. Um, they, they're a team that frequently likes to use transcendences aggressively or to save somebody, um, and that fucks their alt economy for like the next three pushes. Alt economy is so important in GOATS. I don't know what... It's all people used to be able to talk about. People's analysis, right, a year ago used to be... Or not a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago used to be so shit that all they could talk about was the ults. And now, people aren't talking about the ults. And it's like the number one meta for ult economy. Like, you can predict what's going to happen a minute and a half into the future because someone just hit their ults at the wrong time or they invested ults and ended up losing because it's so ult-heavy, uh, goats, that you can, still can win without them, but it's very ult-heavy. So... The fact that they keep fucking their alt economy is really disastrous, and the fact that um, uh, Kuki doesn't look like he's that comfortable being able to coordinate uh, pushes and pulls, um, and also doesn't go for flashy plays, so you don't even get the opportunity to set up like boop shatters or you know these kind of things, or booping people out of position. This is just not an opportunity for you that presents itself. Okay, the other one is the Valiant. Uh, sorry, the other one is the Gladiators as well. And honestly, I had reservations about bringing Decay into this lineup. You guys all know it. If you were watching my stream, people would ask me, is Decay going to make this team incredible? And I said, I don't know if they're even going to run him. Because Shurfor is such an integral part of their of what I would consider their team and how their team functions. And Gladiators is all about having like a well-functioning system and then counter their opponent. They're not about huge, big individual performances. And Shufo was actually, from week one, had improved to where he was really able to hold his own with the other uh, Zarya's. I wouldn't consider Zarya a great hero for him. I don't think he's one of the best Zarya's. But being able to hold your own and using your bubbles at the right time and then having synergy with the rest of your team looks a lot better than what Decay's been able to bring to the lineup. Um, it, it seems a very uh, a fairly solo play style uh and it doesn't look like he's particularly integrated now individually he still looks incredible but the team was all fucking over the place like really all over the place in their last game their engages their old timings they were it was a catastrophe they didn't look like they were on the same page at all and the only thing that's really changed is bringing decay in they're another team that looks like they're getting worse from week to week because apart from that initial game where they played against Seoul and neither team really looked great from there when they played against san francisco shock and then paris and then eh, not really against london but somewhat against london they looked fairly decent they looked at their best when they were playing against san francisco shock very clean disengages a lot of punish great counter stratting against paris eternal uh, they made a lot more mistakes. It looked more disjointed, but they um, still had some nice opportunities to be able to win maps. Uh, against London, they looked like they were crumbling a little, and against uh, Spark, they have they were really fucking all over the place. So, and also, the LA Gladiators' strength of schedule is really quite brutal. Um, let me just bring it up and remind myself who they're playing. They're playing against Rain next, who look like they're actually becoming a top team in this meta, which, I mean, fuck me, who saw that coming? All the Rain fans, apparently. No, you fucking didn't. Sit, sit down. Sit down. St delete the tweet. Delete the tweet. I don't want you atting me. You didn't see it coming. Shut up. Um, 
Then they play the Charge, who are looking pretty decent. Then they play Dragons, who could definitely win. Then they play Soul, who they lost to at the beginning of the season. And then they play the Valiant, so one team's got to win, don't they? And that's uh, by that time, we're in Stage 2. So, both of these teams have a very rough strength of schedule, but they also seem to be getting worse in, in terms of their coordination, which is very strange to me. Uh, I didn't see that coming at all. Anyway, let's get go on to the next question. Spent a lot of time on that. Would you rather fight 10 Soei-sized reinforces or one reinforced-sized Soei? I'm going to be honest with you, there is clearly only one choice here. Because the size difference is not so much that it's like a duck and a bull, where I could just kick the shit out of 10 duck-sized bulls. It's it's more right. Okay, reinforce is six foot seven. So he is five five. I want to say some something around that. No, is there a full foot difference between them? I think there is about a foot difference. Maybe a bit more. Okay. Anyway, so ten five foot five, fairly like. Uh, goes to the gym a lot blokes could beat the shit out of me if I tried to take on 10 5 foot 5 reinforces I'd get my teeth mashed in I'd be drinking through a straw for the rest of my life I mean it would take quite a bit for me be to be able to beat one so he sized reinforce like reinforce if he was my height would knock the shit out of me you know, I think he's actually a gentle giant. He, he probably he probably wouldn't. I've got the advantage over him in terms of I, I have less morals. I think I'd just beat his head in. You know, <laughs> he'd he'd be wondering like, oh, can I really do this? He's a friend. While well, I'd be picking up a knife. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, or one reinforced I Soey. So I would definitely fight one reinforced I Soey. Soey is definitely more vicious, and fuck me at six foot seven, that would be a terror. But. There is no way that I could take 10 5 foot 4 men. So, uh, that's that's my only chance. My only chance is trying to use Soe's newfound height against her as her center of gravity shifted higher. And maybe I can get her to, like, you know, throw a haymaker and knock her off balance. And I'll just, I don't know, trip her up or something. Fuck me. Either way, I'm not coming out of that one alive, probably. Uh, that was by My Name is Alex as well. Um... Uberchain says, what was the moment in your esports career when it dawned on you that it was like, this is it, I've made it, I did the damn thing, and now I'm here? Um, it was all fair. Okay, so I think I'll preface this by saying that those moments don't really happen that much with me. I don't, uh, I don't feel... This is going to sound fucking dumb. I don't feel, you know, a great sense of pride or accomplishment or anything... Uh, about anything I do until I look back on uh, look back on it you know from like uh, from a distance um, and a lot of the stuff I've done recently I've just been striving to get a lot better like I, I feel like the whole of 2018 owl I didn't have a moment like that where I was like oh sick you know, like even the finals or whatever when we were in the Barclays arena didn't really get to me that much um, it was cool, for sure, but there were so many things that I wanted to do better next time that it I didn't really have that feeling of accomplishment. I, I don't think we did a bad job by any means, but um, I've just been so focused on improvement that I'm not really thinking about accomplishment because I could do it so much better if I went and did it again. Um, having said that, there are a couple of instances that spring to mind in uh, before I joined the Overwatch League. Um, and it was mostly around contenders because uh, I when when Overwatch was released in May 2016, I took up Overwatch as my full time source of income, which pff, risky maneuver, by the way. But I didn't really have any other options because I dropped out of medicine and really didn't want to get a, a regular job and you know cut into my esports time. I just thought, okay, I'll work for like wait i'll work for like half the poverty line in the uk and just eat bread and beans for the rest of my life and skip meals and stuff just to see if i can make this go somewhere which by the way all true and might tell you about that sometime literally lived like a fucking i don't know mad poverty man for ages anyway um so after yeah from going from that then being asked to come to uh Take TV and then Contenders was a very big deal because that 
moved me from working in journalism and content creation and stuff like that, where honestly the money you're able to make is a pittance um, because the, the viewership just isn't there unless you already have a big name or it just takes you a long time to be able to build it up. Um, then being picked up for, you know, casting opportunities meant that, first of all, I was on Blizzard's radar for people, you know, to potentially work in Owl in what I thought was maybe like season two or season three. Um, and also it just meant that there was a much larger source of income available to me. Um, and I would get to work on, you know, a sanctioned Blizzard project. So even if I, it didn't go anywhere in the future, at least that would, you know, bolster my name or whatever. So, uh, Actually going uh, to work for Contenders Season Zero, I think that was, in Colorado, um, and meeting Monty, Doa, Puckett, Mr. X, Golden Boy, uh, being able to work with all of those guys to be able to learn from them um, was pretty massive because I'd seen these guys around in the esports scene because I'd been you know, following it at that point for, what, four years and had looked at all of these people uh, particularly the ones that make a shit ton of content uh like i guess esoteric content about making content like monty and like thorin and people like that and richard lewis the people that make content about making content in e in esports are the most useful people to learn from when you are trying to make it as a content creator right so especially being able to interact with them and pick some of their brains and stuff like that was a big deal um, and then doing the the finals in LA and being able to experience LA and you know we we went to uh, like a, a house party with some of the Overwatch people up in I don't know was it the Hollywood Hills or the Beverly Hills or something and then after Contenders had finished and I felt like we did a pretty decent job and it was nice to be able to work at the Blizzard Arena and stuff I got a call asking me if uh, uh, if I'd like to work on Overwatch League season one so within that kind of weekend of the finals of LA. Um, it was that was a pretty big moment of uh okay i'm here i'm actually doing it i'm doing it at the top level now rather than um you know trying to get into that uh, upper echelon so i think of all the moments in my esports career working the contenders season zero finals in la uh, and all that it encapsulated you know working with people at the top of the industry uh doing a live finals in front of a uh, a live studio audience um hanging out in the hollywood hills and stuff and and then getting a call to uh, join the overwatch league that was probably the biggest moment like that but as i say there hasn't really been one since then and i think the only thing that would be able to really push that um the next like goal post where i would probably think oh this is it i've done it i've uh, you know uh i've really done something impressive is if uh, so the next big goal would be to try and make the projects that I'm working on this year, like Watchpoint, like the stream, like my YouTube channel and that kind of stuff, is to really push that so that it's <coughs> considered a really great side product alongside OWL, uh, particularly the Watchpoint shows. It's something I really want to do is, is take Watchpoint from not single-handedly obviously but with the rest of the team to be able to take watchpoint from being you know some niche side content that some people tune into to being a major draw so that it's like really um uh highly viewed highly anticipated um highly um appreciated by the community that would be the next big thing to work on um okay Jason asks, what are your power rankings of every meta Overwatch has ever had by how exciting they were to watch? What a fucking easy question, Jason. Every meta Overwatch has ever had by how exciting they were to watch. Fuck me. So before I started this video, I had to just think in my head, what metas have we even gone through? So I may have missed some, but I'm going to just list them in chronological order from like how I would define the metas that we've gone through in Overwatch. Um, so in so this is going to be a, another um, uh, a controversial point, but I think a st a good starting point for me is actually the uh, the Overwatch Open, and I know that we had the Atlantic Showdown that happened before that, but the meta there was very undefined because teams had been you know half the teams have been playing in uh, North America, half the teams have been playing in Europe. Not, none of the teams had a great grasp on Overwatch at that point, and 
all everything had been online up until that tournament so the um the ability to learn from each other and mix playstyles around and actually have some kind of structured meta wasn't really there. Uh, so I'm going to ignore history before the Overwatch Open, okay, in terms of uh, this question. Uh, so at the Overwatch Open, we had the NIP triple tank uh, kind of stuff. Um, so the triple tank, triple support, and the triple tank with a one DPS, which was normally Zappis running around on a bunch of different stuff. Um, and the Misfits kind of Beyblade strategy with May Reaper. Then we had, uh, going on from that, NA started playing a load of quad tank. And then um, we had triple tank soldier in the Apex Season 1 playoffs. So that was the one that Envious ended up uh, doing well and winning, uh, winning with. Um, and that came as an evolution out of the Beyblade strat. Uh, then for Apex Season 2, we had a mixture of that triple tank uh, 1 DPS with, uh, you know, Reinhardt, Hog, Diva. And then we had a Dive as well. So people were playing quite a bit of Dive, you know, I Am Kyangi, Apex Season 2, that kind of stuff. There was a mixture of uh, Genji Tracer and, you know, Rein, weirdly. But okay. Uh, then when we went on uh, back in Europe people were playing a shit ton of triple DPS after Apex Season 2 and this was the time when we also had the selfless composition as well so we had triple DPS, selfless comp um, and was there something else as well? yeah and NA was still playing a lot of triple tank tri uh, triple tank at that point as well so we had a lot of triple and quad tank in NA but also the selfless comp and triple DPS so that was a pretty varied time then we had dive with Sombra added into it for Apex Season 3 um, you know, Apex Season 3 you could still play a lot of dive you could play a lot of uh, Tracer Sombra or the Sombra could be part of your um, flex support stuff as well it really was like quite a Sombra dominated meta especially as we got later towards the playoffs uh, Apex Season 4 was classic Soldier Tracer dive. Uh, that was incredibly structured. And then at, also, you know, teams could play Genji Tracer dive as well, but Soldier Tracer tended to be better. Um, but in the finals, both teams did play the, the Genji Tracer. Then when we get into the beginning of 20... Well, late... Yeah, beginning of 2018, we had the Mercy meta. Um, the dive and anti-dive meta it then progressed into with teams playing a lot of Junkrat Widow, which again is, is part of the Mercy meta, but... Um, was separate from it as well uh you know the mercy meta i was i'm thinking of is like the valkyrie where you get double instant rares and stuff like that uh so dive and anti-dive meta where there was a lot of teams playing dive and a lot of teams playing junkrat widow as well and we were trying to figure out like which style count is which and how do you manage to get uh mad value out of both of those then as we got into stage two and three when there was volsky and Route 66 being played a ton amount a ton of widowmaker tracer was being played which was a lot of fun to watch and then in stage four we had the brig stuff where there was a lot more ryan brig being played and also double sniper with the double sniper orissa uh compositions and now you know after that we had goats and that has been goats with various variations up until now so that's you know a, a trend of the metas throughout i may have missed you know something here or there but those are the main ones in terms of how i would rank those i think the triple dps and selfless composition times were the best matches to watch um they were incredibly fast paced and really fun uh the spawn camping coming out from the selfless comp was amazing but also just that there was only really one team that could run the selfless composition really well that i loved um that a team had found a niche that fit them so perfectly and had such a weird style but made it work so well i mean that was fantastic uh and that inspired me to do a video about the selfless composition which you can go back and look at my channel just search selfless and you'll find it uh and also triple dps you know like rogue using triple dps and then it's spawning e united and cyclones and all of these teams that were really good with it and uh what were some of the teams well movistar riders um and this is where we saw a lot of the the big names like swoosh like logics um Mausasa, I guess, Davin, uh, these guys had, uh, had kind of rose up at the time of Triple DPS because it really showcased a lot of individual skill. So that was fantastic to watch. Uh, my second favorite meta is probably the dive and triple tank stuff from IEM Kyangi and Apex Season 2. Apex Season 2 may be my favorite tournament of all time. 
I think I like the playoffs and the story of Apex Season 4 more, and I was a big Juicy Busan fan, and I thought they were fantastic, and I loved the way the Jester and Prophet played, and it made me incredibly happy to watch them. But the entire tournament as a whole, and all the meta that was being played, and the way the teams could play triple tank, but could also play dive, and you had to be good at both, so there was like LW Blue who was really excellent at both, and then Cogni Panthera who was really excellent at both, but in the end it ended up being uh, uh, Lunatic High who were able to come out with um, some fantastic uh, strategies and end up taking the win. And Runaway as well, this was you know, their, their breakout season. So I think Apex Season 2 was fantastic, and I think the meta did a lot to be able to make that so great as well. Um, just the fact that you could play so defensively with uh, Triple Tank and yet um, play hyper-aggressive styles with Dive as well. Really cool. Uh, well, the next one is Apex Season 4, I think. The Soldier Tracer Dive, and then the fact that in the finals they were playing the Genji Tracer. Like, both were viable. Soldier Tracer should have been better, but Runaway was just so good with Genji Tracer Dive that uh, Jisoo Busan couldn't match it and had to go over to Dive themselves and just have Profit hard carry their asses on Genji. I mean, that was a nuts meta. And also just very structured. And uh, actually, what I love about Apex Season 4 is that it ushered in a new era of um, thinking about duos with Profit and Gesture just demolishing everybody. It really set the path for... Um, how Winston Tracer synergies should work, or just synergies between two people in teams at all, and uh, started an era for Gesture and Profit, which, if you want to consider um, Overwatch League as one tournament rather than four separate stages, has still not been stopped, by the way. Gesture and Profit are unbeaten so far in tournaments that they've entered. Uh, they won Apex Season 4, they won Apex Premier, and then they won Overwatch League Season 1. So... Uh, here comes Overwatch League Season 2, and at that point, they have well and truly created a dynasty. Now, my fourth favorite meta... is actually... Um, is actually GOATS. As, as... As bad as that sounds, and I'm sure I'm going to have to give you reasons why, my fourth favorite meta out of the, what is it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Out of the roughly 11 that I've said have like dominated since late 2016, Goats is my fourth favorite. And that's above stuff like Widowmaker Tracer, where we saw Striker and Sabi all be going nutty on Tracer and stuff. And that's above like Dive and Sombra, and I loved looking at Sombra stuff. But I find Goats really interesting. I think it's got a shit ton of complexity to it in terms of how you um, how you rotate all of your resources and how you uh, use your ultimates. And I just think there's a lot of really cool stuff. I, I think the more you know about Goats, the more you enjoy watching Goats. And... All you have to do... Uh, here's the thing, right? Widowmaker Tracer, really good to watch. But if I'm spectating it and watching the game, uh, I'm either watching a Tracer go bananas or I'm watching a Widowmaker uh, pop off. Um, but in order to really appreciate some kind of bigger team strategy, you need to be able to see the top-down map, you need to see where players are positioned. The subtleties of creating an angle for your Widow really aren't that interesting, and it comes down to a lot the, of the mechanical skill and the timing of your Winston and your Tracer and then the Widowmaker. So, I enjoy watching that, I enjoy watching the individual performances, I think they're sick. But, to be able to see big individual plays, like... Uh, Bumper going wild for the Vancouver Titans. Um, certain Sombras and Zarias just melting through people. And also to be able to see every little piece of the clockwork play out in front of you. That, to me, is beauty. That is actual beauty in Overwatch. To be able to look at a fight and think, okay, there's a finite amount of resources available to these two teams, and it's all based on how they use them. Management of cooldowns. So, when you see a bubble, and it's at the wrong time compared to another bubble, you can anticipate the future, and you know that they're going to attack, and you know that you can kind of see the dance of it play out in your head. And no other... Because the time to kill on a lot of these other metas is so short, where to make a dive, stuff like that, there isn't really that interplay between the two teams there isn't that dance that rhythm that goats has 
um, when, for example, even in triple tank of old, if a team gets a hook, they're getting that pick, and then you know that the fight is basically won. Um, but the fact that fights take much longer in goats, and even if you set yourselves up a very favorable advantage, if the alt economy is against you, the other team can still bring it back, or if a player gets out of position or makes a mistake, that can all crumble again. Um, and there's so many map rotations, but they're not difficult to see. You don't need the overhead map because both teams are rotating kind of opposite to each other. Again, the dance of it. I, I think it's actually a really beautiful meta. Um, and... I, I wish more people appreciated it. I mean, I, I know that people might be saying, you know, oh, how the fuck can you say this? Or you always say this. You thought the Mercy meta wasn't that bad as well. And I also, don't get me wrong, I thought the Mercy meta was okay. Um, I think it enabled a lot of heroes that were cool to watch, like, for example, the Widowmaker and, like, the pocketing of the Zenyatas and stuff like that. But GOATS truly is actually a beautiful meta to watch. To see the... To see everything laid out on the table and nothing hidden... And to see two teams jockey for position for their Zarya so hard, um, because everything takes longer, you can appreciate it more. And I, I, I don't know. I think it's a really fucking awesome meta. So there you go. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's tragic when two teams don't know how to play it well. But watching, like, Shock play against Titans or... Um, Something like that was uh, actually fantastic. And watching the Titans play against NYXL, if we get that in the stage finals, again, going to be beautiful. You know, both teams being able to give up space and then re-push and rotating people off high grounds, syncing up ultimates, but being able to deny the sync up of ultimates because you don't just die in a flash like that. You actually have time to be able to make counter plays. I think it's fantastic, uh, personally. And uh, you can go eat a dick if you don't like it. Um... All right, so then I think Widowmaker Tracer is another really good one for the reasons that I said before. Widowmakers and Tracers are two of the most fun heroes to watch pop off individually. Tracer in particular, I love watching Prophet, Sabi Obi, Carpe, just wreck people, go through them like mad. I think Dive and Sombra was another good one from Apex Season... That must have been Apex Season 3, wasn't it? Yeah, Apex Season 3, where Esko was playing the Sombra classically for Lunatic High, and there was a lot of mind games around how you would use the Sombra and hacking the enemy's health pack and, you know, being able to get these uh, these D-Mechs on the D.Va and roll that forwards. I thought that was really cool. It kind of ushered in a new era of thinking about using Sombra, so that was really interesting to watch. I thought the Beyblade and NIP triple tank stuff was pretty interesting, the way that those two metas played against each other. Um, and also the mastery that Misfits and Rogue had over the Beyblade uh, composition. Um, having said that, though, this is where we start to get into metas that I don't really enjoy. So I did actually like most of the metas, and I'd be perfectly happy to go to basically any meta because I just like the game of Overwatch. Um, but Beyblade and NIP Triple Tank is where we start getting into metas that I'm like, eh, wasn't that good. Then the Double Sniper and Brigitte stuff from the playoffs and from the end of uh, Overwatch League last season. I didn't think it was that great. I think the Arissa Halt Hook stuff is, you know, relatively interesting. Uh, but the fact that we had a solo healer and if they made one misplay, they were dead, uh, put a lot of... Uh, it cramped the opportunities it greatly reduced the degrees of freedom that teams had to be able to play with having said that the finals were still really interesting and there's a lot of various ways you could go with it and we still had some really interesting double sniper crossfires and stuff like that but i just didn't think it was the greatest matter in the world to to uh, to watch it was quite static um then the quad tank and triple tank soldier stuff from like late 2016 i mean watching mlg vegas where all of the na teams tried to play quad tank and some triple tank to be fair to them as well uh, and actually some dive stuff. I remember Shadow Plum playing Genji. Or was that even Genji with Triple Tank? I can't remember. Some weird shit back then. Yeah, most of the 2016 methods are not that great because teams just didn't know how to play the game that well. Um, yeah, and and so the Triple Tank Soldier stuff from the end of Apex Season 1 was, you know, it was okay. Uh, getting the, the Shatter and then the, um, the Diva Bomb behind them and having, you know, Harry Hook being able to play Soldier and looking really good was... It was interesting, but it wasn't the greatest matter in the world. And I think Quad Tank was a piece of shit. I've never been a fan of Quad Tank. It's just literally, like, like Gods, except you actually just run into people and fucking hold W. Um, then the Dive and Anti-Dive meta from the beginning of Owl 2018, um, I thought was was pretty good um 
Actually, maybe this one should be higher up because I did actually quite enjoy this. Yeah, this one should be higher up, actually. Um, maybe this one would even be above Double Sniper and Brig, Brig stuff because I, I actually quite liked watching Dive play against Counter Dive. The Boston versus Houston game at the end of uh, Stage 1 where Houston just went like hardcore anti-dive where they are playing Junkrat Widow with Jake and Linksa and, uh, and Boston played hardcore dive and even like five-man diving at times with Kellex. Um was it was interesting to see how that worked out um but i think it was you know junkrat with the rip tires made some maps just horrible like uh horizon lunar colony and anubis were just fucking horrible because junkrat would just sit in a very defendable location and the rip tires were getting like two or three kills every time and last would be the mercy meta in terms of when it was mad dominant and you could just get double insta reses i think that was a pretty poor meta to watch personally because um you had to just think of a pick as burning a cooldown and uh even though it did give you a big advantage in the fight it, it wasn't satisfying to watch at all and the mercy matter as it got later on was much more satisfying because it took much longer to be able to resurrect a target you had to protect your mercy when they went in we were having people like neptuno who'd still go for those really ballsy, ballsy reses i think that was Really good to watch, actually. Uh, but when you could just get Valkyrie in two instant reses, that was shit. Okay. Uh, what do you think the best criteria are for Owl MVP? And I think the... My, my criteria for Owl MVP would be... First of all, that you have to have performed pretty well over the entirety of of the overwatch league i think the playoff mvp is fine for the playoffs but the overwatch league mvp has to be somebody that uh, performed over at least the majority of the overwatch league uh, if you sucked in stage one because the goats matter was there but like stage two three and four you are a transcendent talent on i don't know farah or you know something like that then fair enough but if you only have, you know, one stage that's really good or something like that, I don't think you can really be considered for our MVP. Um, I think as well, there's always the debate with MVPs, whether it's the most valuable player to a team, like a big hard carry for a team, or whether it's uh, the best player. So are you trying to pick who is the best player in our, like, for example, who would you draft first? If you got your pick of the whole of the Overwatch League, who would you draft first? If you ignore the idea of you know certain roles being you know being filled with more competitive people or whatever, like for example, if you were actually to draft a team, you would probably want to pick a flex support or a main tank first because they tend to be the most important roles. But uh, those might not be actually the best players in the league. Uh, but I think one of the problems with the Overwatch League MVP vote from last year was that some of the votes were just ridiculous. Like some of the votes that came out after the fact um, were like for, for example, for uh, agilities or I mean some were for Gregory. Like come the fuck on, and others were for um, who else got? Oh, others were just for people on their own team. Like I think Tayrong picked three players from the Houston Outlaws who finished in like seventh out of twelve and looked really un underwhelming for a large amount of the season. I mean, these are just pathetic picks. Like the in order for our MVP to mean anything, you actually uh, yeah actually have to uh, have some uh, yeah you have to be reasonable about it. Um. I would say though that the best criteria is a mix of all of these things. Jonak I think was excellent last year because he redefined how people thought about the flex support role. And we'd already had one player before this, Jae Hong, who'd, who'd done that. Jae Hong was like the mirror of flex supports, right? He, he took a role that a lot of people were thinking didn't have much clutch potential and was there to support the rest of the team. Um, although we did know that guys like Unko were pretty deadly on Zen even before we saw Jae Hong, but he took Anna, a hero that wasn't that great, and showed that you could, you know, really make very clutch plays on it. And what Jonak did was show that you can take Zen and have it be as much, like, as much a very deadly force on your team as a bit of support from the backline. Um, you can really build a team around making Zen incredibly deadly. Uh, 
but I don't think it's necessarily the case that someone has to redefine how the game is played in order to get our MVP. Um, for example, if uh, if Bumper continues to be a fantastic main tank and um, just plays really well on Winston as well, and it's not like his... Well, to be fair, Bumper's maybe a bad example because he does actually play a crazy style, doesn't he? But let's say, let's say Mano, actually. Mano's a great... Uh, example for this. Mano plays a very structured style. He's not pushing the envelope on main tank. He's just making percentage plays, but making them consistently. He's excellent on every different type of uh, uh, of play style of main tank. He can play every hero that he's needed to. Um, he never throws for his team, you know? So, I think uh, he could very easily be an all MVP candidate. Um, if he continues to have really great performances, even though he doesn't redefine what a role does. I think it's always going to be really hard for the main support to be able to get our MVP, just because even in a meta like this, where Lucios actually do have huge amounts of impact, uh, there are other players that have more impact. And a lot of the stuff that Lucios do, like for example, calling, um, speed boost, engages and disengages tend to get lost in the um or either aren't possible to see in the case of the calling or tend to get lost in the in the moment uh yeah do i have anything else to say about the all mvp vote i would uh, just as a final note as well i would tend to stray away from the most valuable player in its most literal definition for example the if you had a 10th place team but they were the most they had one player that just literally carried them to that position they might be the most valuable player to their team in the entire league like that that player might be completely irreplaceable and if you got anybody else your team would be sh total shit uh, so they might be the most valuable player but i don't think they should get the all mvp vote because i think that, it, that really what the mvp means is the the best it's supposed to be an honorific of you have been an absolute standout player this season and um that i think is the is the aim of uh, of the accolade sweetly sarcastic says what do you think of the new hero and this is a a, a tough one but i do get it all the time so i'm gonna try and tackle it here i think the new hero looks fairly powerful i think that he's a pretty good off healer that gives a lot of additional resources to his team. Um, the damage is... Well, for starters, let's, let's go there as well. If you want to do a lot of damage with this hero, it's probably going to re require a subset of player that we haven't really seen yet, which is somebody who's really good at tracking, uh, but also plays support, because it's very likely that you'll need a support to be able to uh switch over to this you know you'll you'll probably not have a meta where you just get to play batiste the entire time um and so you want to maximize your damage output so you want to have pretty good tracking and you actually need really good tracking i think to be able to hit those three uh burst you know the burst fire and be able to make it very good uh, to actually make the uh, the damage output decent and then uh it also seems to so here's another issue with it as well i think is that it doesn't really synergize that well in a support duo pairing with one of the other uh off healers like zen or like anna for example um so because zen is so powerful it seems likely to me that it might be running kind of an off healer kind of role uh you know when people used to say very stupidly that Soldier 76 was an off healer because he had a biotic field. I think I feel like this is a hero that you could run in, like an off healer, triple healer kind of scenario, where you wouldn't even really think of him as a healer. He would be a support for sure and be able to do a lot of healing, um, but you'd think of him as kind of something in between where you're really running him because he has that uh, immortality field and he can also contribute to the healing and he can do uh, a bit of damage as well. Uh, so... I can. S I, he doesn't really have a natural place that he fits for me in terms of the meta. Now, in terms of what he does, uh, Batiste seems to fit more static compositions, in my opinion, as well. 
uh, he does have good mobility with his jump, for sure. But a lot of his abilities, um, the, the resources that he can offer for the team, only really benefit if you're playing fairly static compositions. The immortality field isn't going to help if you're playing... Uh, isn't going to help that much anyway. If you're playing something like uh, Dive or you're playing even, even Goats, honestly. Because I... What I'm pretty sure is it will just happen in that situation is, let's take dive first. If you use it on your backline to pr try and protect your backline as they get dived, um, it's as soon as that goes down, it's just an opportunity for the enemy team to disengage or for your supports to end up getting trapped in a poor position because they have to stay at very weak health inside that immortality field until it's destroyed. So they can't go and seek shelter because they don't leave the immortality field. Um, and then when the immortality field goes down, you've got some very weak players inside of it. Um, and the disengage argument, I think, applies perfectly well to GOATS as well. If there's an immortality field put down, you are just going to disengage and try and focus down the immortality field and then re-engage. Um, so I feel like it because it's so static, it will be very easy to kite. Uh, maybe that won't be the case. Maybe people will find um, opportunities to use it. Like, for example, when you have to play the objective... That seems like a very good way of being able to get value out of the immortality field. There are areas where you can force people to play in a certain location and get big value out of it. But for a lot of for a lot of metas that we've seen in Overwatch, mobility is a massive part of it. And being able to rotate, you know, vulnerable targets or be able to rotate um, aggression around the map. And because also his ultimate is just one place and then you shoot through it. I mean, you're just going to be able to kite that pretty easily, I think. So it seems to lend itself more towards, like, Arisa compositions where you want to stay in one location um, and you want to just, like, hold your ground, um, this kind of stuff. Yeah, more like poke compositions. The other thing as well is I think people are overrating how good the immortality field's going to be. It, it, at the end of the day, w when people are doing, like, a like a grab bomb combo or something like that on you, if you use the immortality or, or any other like large ultimate investment, if it gets negated by the immortality field, you are still all going to be super fucking weak in there. And if they focus down the immortality field and engage on you, they are probably going to win. So the situations in which you can use an immortality field also necessitate some kind of large amount of healing as well. Um, so... I don't know, I don't think it's as cut and dry as this guy's just mad OP, he's going to be played and everything. Uh, but also, I would say that a strong caveat here, nobody really knows what the hell they're talking about until the game gets tested a lot. And this is why I don't like to do um, articles or videos in general about new hero releases and methods and patch changes, even though I know they're going to be crazy popular. It's just that people are just talking out their ass until it gets tested. Uh, you can do all the theory crafting in the world you like, but this is why de developer changes and balance changes are so difficult. Is because we've just had a massive PTR shift. Nobody knows if that's going to affect goats. Some people think it won't at all. Some people think that it absolutely goats is dead, and you don't know until you test it and try it out. Uh, because there are just so many different variables in the game that it becomes incredibly difficult to uh, to predict the future. All right, I think we're getting uh, close to the one hour mark. I may have completely missed it. We may even be past the one hour mark, but I'm going to I'm gonna uh, go through a couple more questions. Baby Blue asked, if you had to bring someone onto Would I Lie to You to be your This Is My, who would it be? Now, if you're not familiar with Would I Lie to You, go and look it up on YouTube. Absolutely fantastic um, uh, show. One of the greatest uh, formats for a panel show of all time, and I fucking love panel shows. Um, the idea is that the comedians bring on oh, the guests bring on a, a guest themselves and there's three of them sat down and each of them claims to know this person and says you know one of them says a true little snippet about them and the other two have to say lies about this person and the other team has to guess which one of them's uh, is actually true so they all tend to be fairly ridiculous stories so i if i was doing that and it was my turn to tell the truth. I would bring on a friend that I have called Anna. Um, and I haven't really uh, I haven't really seen her in quite a, quite a while. So I think bring Anna on and I would say, uh, this is my friend Anna and I can never go back to her house again. 
after I fled from her party eight years ago, fearing retribution from her father. Uh, and that, uh, and that is because I um, when we were at a house party when I was about sixteen, and she's really short. She's like five foot three or something, five foot two. She's super small, um, and just coincidentally, all of the all of the ceilings in our house are really short as well because the rest of her family isn't short. It's just her, and so. Uh, for some reason, we were 16 and we were drunk, and I said, "Oh, I reckon I could, I could uh, jump and touch the ceiling um, with my head," because she was trying to jump and touch the ceiling and couldn't even do it with her arms because she was that short. And I was like, "All right, I reckon I could do it and not even need to use my hands. I reckon I could jump and just touch your head, touch it with my head." And because I was drunk, I completely mistimed it, and I jumped up and I straight up went. Rush and just headbutted a massive hole in her ceiling. I mean, this thing was my head, like my forehead is massive, right? So it was my forehead imprinted in her ceiling. And I just looked at it and I was like, oh, fuck, what have I done? And I'm 16, I got no income. I, I've got no way of being able to pay for that. So I was like, oh, bugger. So I stayed, had a couple more beers, laughed about it, but then. As the night got old and her parents were about to come back, I I I left. I left, and I'm not uh, not proud of that. Definitely should have owned up and apologized to her parents, and uh, you know offered to pay in whatever way I could. But instead, I dodged the responsibility, went home, and left Anna to deal with that. And so. I, through pure shame, I can never return to her household and certainly can never look her father in the eye and uh, say, sorry about, you know, eight years ago when I probably cost you a couple hundred in uh, in plastering and repairs because I was mocking your daughter and headbutted your ceiling. Uh, yeah, so never going back there again. Uh... Okay, how long have I actually spent doing this now? I have no idea. There's no way of telling. Um, so I'm going to leave it there for now. I've got a bunch more questions, but I'll just add them onto next week's. And if you would like to add a question yourself, uh, then add your... Well, first of all, you have to be a sub. And secondly, if you type exclamation mark Discord in my uh, Twitch channel, you can get uh, entry into the discord it'll automatically recognize that you're a sub if you've linked twitch with discord and you can ask questions in the subs only bro channel uh so until then uh, goodbye